All right, Yao, 2011 with the great Simon Peyton Jones. <laughs> Thanks for coming on Channel 9. It's been a long time. It has, Charles. Nice to see you again. Yeah, <laughs> so remember that conversation? I think it was a seven-minute conversation we had with you and Eric Meyer in Cambridge. It was a random, one of those really random ones Right, on just couch. on the sofa, right? <laughs> yeah, so you did that really excellent diagram of useful versus safe. Like, uh, and Nirvana was sort of in the useful and safe mm -hmm. region. Is Haskell getting closer to Nirvana? Sure it is. Okay. Little, little piece by piece. Um, so uh, what's been happening, we've been doing quite a lot of work on parallelism. Okay. And quite a lot of work on types. Mm. Um, and the types bit, this was also my talk last night. I kind of, I kind of begun to, um, to see uh, bad type systems leave you with lots of programs that you would like to write that are ill-typed. Mm. And that gives type systems a bad name. Okay. And so what we're about is to try to um, try to make the type system itself more expressive, mm. so that um, so that there are fewer programs that you would like to write. That is the ones that will work, that are ill-typed. Okay. Right. Because I think if you can if you can write the program that you want to write and it's well typed, then you're way <laughs> further ahead than if you're writing in an untyped language. And that the, but at the moment, dynamic languages are, are of, uh, all of age, aren't they? Yes, they they're, are. They're big at the moment, yeah. and for good reasons. And they, you know, there's, there's always going to be some programs that you can't write in, in uh, strongly typed languages. But the name of the game I'm trying to, to do with Haskell is to sort of push the boundaries, move in the direction that's been uh, stamped out by really sophisticated, uh, full-spectrum, dependently typed languages. Mm -hmm. Just move baby steps in that direction to try to make the type system a bit more expressive. OK. Um, so I think we're beginning to, there's, there's been a lot happening um, in that area in Haskell at the moment. So let me ask you, let's talk about the sort of the, the, the bigger picture there. I mean, what mm -hmm. is it about um, extremely typed type systems or strongly typed type systems, if you will? Why, why, why is that so important to you? Like, talk to me about uh, that. Well, I always hesitate a little here because I don't like getting into the, the kind of rather sterile debate about, you know, I like dynamically dynam no, no, no. typed language versus I like statically typed ones. I agree with you. So, but, but nevertheless, so, so I write quite a lot of code myself. I mean, it happens to be, you know, the code for <laughs> GHC, but it's a pretty large program and it's now 20 years old. So I've been maintaining this same code base for 20 years. Wow. And often I come across pieces of it. I say, I want to make some systematic change here. And uh, the types already tell me a lot about what's going on. And if I change some data representation, I know that I'm going to find all the places in the rest of the compiler where I need to change. So it's a, it's kind of, it doesn't mean that the program is going to work, but it's mm. surprising how often your know, well-typed programs do work once you get the types right. Okay. Um, so um, types for me are a kind of design language, if you like, um, that if I'm starting to write a new program, I'll often write down the types of the major functions as a way to say, this is the kind of API I'm building. Okay. And I want a formal language to write that down in that is continuously machine checked. So if you like, it's as if the compiler is like a theorem prover that is running against my program every time I compile a program. It's just sort of, and it can only check relatively simple low level properties. But these are still valuable properties, right? Mm -hmm. Think of all the work that's been done dealing with null pointer exceptions or, <laughs> or you know, um, array bound. <laughs> uh, uh, overruns in uh, or, fo fo or following null pointers in C, right? That's the fact that we had programming languages that didn't that allowed these kind of uh, follower null pointer exceptions to happen has caused immense damage down the line, right? If we just had a better language, it would have been fine. So, so in other words, one shouldn't be too um, dismissive about the low hanging fruit. The low hanging fruit is really valuable, and I want to pluck it. I just want to move this sort of plucking a bit further up, if you like. Excellent. Now, quickly, I mean. What language do you program the compiler in? Oh, what do you think? Haskell. Of course. Of yes, man. All right. <laughs> now, you compile to an intermediate state called System F. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? So the whole of, the Haskell's a really big language now. So well, you know, over 20 years, I've added, uh, well, all of us have added quite a lot of features to the source language, right? partly because it's a laboratory in which to experiment with, with uh, source language extensions. But uh, to keep us sane, what we do in GHC is to compile the whole of this really big source language into a really tiny intermediate language. And when I say tiny, I mean really small. So you've probably heard of the lambda calculus. So it yeah. goes <laughs> variables, applications, and lambdas, right? In any real language, you're definitely going to add um, literals you know, and, and some primitive operations. And you're going to add case expressions and data constructors to support algebraic data types. Okay. So then we add let as well. And, um, and we make it an explicitly typed language um, in the, so that, that's, that's the bit that comes from system F, Girard system F. Okay. So whenever you introduce a binder, so like you say, lambda x of type int, lambda x of type A, I, O, B. 
So every binder comes with an explicit type. Now, we don't want to do that in the, in the source language because that's hard for the programmer, right? Well, we want to infer types in the source language, but in the intermediate language, it's fantastic to have everything explicitly typed because by the time it gets optimized, it gets optimized to a form in which you might not be able to infer types anymore. Sure. You see what I mean? Uh -huh. So the fact that there's this very small language that the whole big language compiles to kind of reassures us that we haven't gone crazy when we add some source language feature because it's like syntactic sugar. If I just show you some syntactic sugar and I say, I explain this syntactic sugar just by a translation to a simpler program, you say, oh, now I understand what that is. Right? Right. So if I can, uh, this is like a deeper version of that, because I'm taking the whole of this rather complicated langu language Haskell and compiling it to this small intermediate. Um, so I think of it, it both as a, um, a sanity check, so it says whether we're doing something crazy in the source language world, mm. um, and also it's a very powerful implementation technique, because it means that the optimizer for GHC is working on this tiny language. So you know, add crazy new source stuff, same optimizer will still crank away and optimize it. It's a sort of powerful point of leverage, if you like. Excellent. The last thing about the tiny intermediate source language is that because it's explicitly typed, even though if the optimizer is correct, it should transform well-typed programs into well-typed programs, right? nevertheless, it's all too easy to screw up your optimizer right? and to write some, something in your compiler that messes, messes things up. Mm -hmm. And then if you run that, program crashes, right? seg fault. Oh, that's terrible, right? <laughs> really hard to debug. But since the intermediate language is well-typed, that means right down the optimization pipeline, at any stage, we can stop and say, let's type check it, mm. right? And if that says it passes, then it's not going to seg fault unless something further down the pipeline is screwed up. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So it's a powerful internal consistency check. So programmers don't care about this, but I care about it. It's kind of like having a lint for the compiler itself. Nice. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit about um, the, the sort of specifically how Haskell has, um, how shall I say, modernized, is that, a, is that a fair term, for general purpose use. So people are actually using it now mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in production. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just an academic sort of testing lab laboratory, which it still is. Right, but right. Can you talk a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah. So I, I suppose this has been a long term, uh, you know, a long slow burn, but Haskell started off pretty uh, geeky, right? As I was saying in my talk, it didn't even have any serious form of I.O. Um, so what are the big, thing, big things that have changed? Well, early on, we developed a sensible form of I.O. and a foreign function interface that makes it, then that sort of makes it possible to talk to the rest of the world. I think probably in terms of what you're asking about, the most significant thing that's happened is that we've done a much better job about libraries. Mm. Um, so, and this is not my work at all. This is a, a system called Cabal that lets, um, lets uh, Haskell, Haskell users write a bunch of Haskell modules, package them up with some metadata into a thing that we call a package, and a package is a unit of distribution. Mm. Right? So they'll take the package with its metadata and upload it to Hackage, and there's about 12 uploads a day happening. Nice. Um, and there's 3,500 libraries on Hackage now. So suddenly, there are cryptography libraries and w internet access libraries and you know, TCP IP libraries and libraries for manipulating um, strings and compressed strings and encryption. I don't know. There's all kind of crazy stuff. Excellent. Uh, so the problem now, that used to be the problem is, well, you've got the core language, but really it doesn't have any interesting libraries. Now it has too many libraries, <laughs> right? Ah, oh, 3,500. You know, which of the six parser libraries should I use? Yes. So now we're to, but that's a different problem. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a nice problem to have. Sure. Um, so we're busy. Uh, I think, I think, well, when I say we, I don't mean me in this case at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the next step will be to go to Hackage. Hackage is the name of this site. We'll go to Hackage 2, which will have more of a kind of um, ability for, um, for users to write reviews or to rate packages because you can't have some kind of centrally curated thing. Mm. Um, uh, another thing that's helped is that a group of people have um, designed something called the Haskell Platform, which is it's no more than a collection of Haskell tools like GHC and, um, and parser generators and lexer generators, plus a collection of blessed libraries. So that's kind of like a quality control system, right? Good. So there's you know, a half a dozen or a dozen or two dozen core libraries all packaged up in one download called the Haskell platform, and they all work together. So that's been quite significant. So I think these kind of, they're, 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 they're to do with um, packaging and ecosystem things. It's not really research, but it's crucial to making a a programming language that's useful in the real world. And it's just started to happen in the last five years in Haskell in a big way. Excellent. 
Now, still focusing on Haskell, uh, the big thing, and the last time we actually talked, we, I remember having you and Tim Harris as well, and mm -hmm. we talked about software transactional memory and right. the importance in the, in the concurrency mm -hmm. problem, you know, the, mm -hmm. the parallelism issue that we're all apparently having to face. What's going on there? Oh, lots going on. So, uh, <laughs> so transactional memory is now just a routine part of, you know, you get, if you get GHC, you get tra transactional memory. Nice. Um, and it just comes out of the box because uh, it turns out in the context of a functional language, all the things that make it difficult in a full, the full glory of .NET, and indeed Microsoft worked hard on a um, mm. .NET STM SDK, but ended up deciding not, taking it, not to take it any further. Because combined with the complexities of all the real, of the real world of a language designed mainly around mutation, it's too hard. But Haskell has this kind of very spare context in which side effects are rare, right, and somewhat discouraged syntactically. So programmers are pushed, not even gently, pushed quite vigorously in the direction of mm. programming using a pure subset. What that means is that STM, which logs every read and write, mm. um, becomes much more efficient because the reads and writes are only these ones that the programmer said, oh, I can't do it any other way other than imperative mutation. So it just works out of the box. Nice. Um, so that's STM. And indeed, indeed, GHC comes um, out of the box with a, in a parallel garbage collector to run a multi-course. Mm. What's been happening recently? So, um, of late, uh, one, um, uh, one project I've been working with colleagues on is called Data Parallel Haskell. Nice. Uh, so this is because if we're going to program large-scale parallel computations, uh, ST, STM and explicitly spawn concurrency, I think, is good for, oh, I don't know, um, you know two... Five, ten, maybe thirty cores, but not for thirty thousands. Right? <laughs> you, you, you can't. Your brain kind of explodes. Mm. The only way we're going to program big machines is with data parallel algorithms. Um, so, data parallel Haskell is a rather ambitious project based on Guy Blelock's Nestle language. Okay. Um, have we talked about this before? We have not. No. So, um, so the idea. So, I'll, 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 I'll sketch the idea. So, the um, the brand leader in data parallelism is flat data parallelism, meaning for every element of this. The, this, this collection, do something, right? Um, and the something tends to be a sequential operation, and, and we have a good, even though you, this, this, this collection might have 100 million elements in it, we've got a good cost model, a good way of executing. But if we've got, say, 100 processors and 100 million elements, we'll put a million on each processor, and then we'll run a kind of sequential loop that just rips down that, 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 that million elements and do, does a good job, right? Mm -hmm. And then each of the 100 processes does its work, and then they combine their results. And that's much more efficient than spawning 100 million threads, <laughs> right? You see, what, yes. you see what I mean? So because those, these thread overheads become very important sure. when the little unit of work you're doing is quite small. Now, nested data parallelism says, well, you might want to do something in parallel to every element of a collection, but the something that you want to do might itself be a data parallel operation. And that might itself have data parallel operations inside it. So now you can imagine the parallelism tree is kind of recursive, right? And maybe not balanced. Mm. So now you're back to the difficulty that you've got um, uh, a very big tree with, uh, you know, 100 million leaves, right, in the end. Mm. And you don't want to spawn a thread for each of them. And your load balancing model doesn't work very well anymore. Because if you take the top level array, the first spawn point, if you like, if you've divided up equally at that point, well, the subtrees from there might be very ill-balanced. Mm. You see what I mean? Okay. Or it might not be very bushy there, but it might be very bushy lower down. So um, Guy Blelock showed a, a, a static transformation, a compile time transformation, that allows you to write these recursive nested data parallel programs and transform them at compile time into flat data parallel programs. That is, you transform the program you want to write into the program you want to execute. Nice. What an amazing thing. <laughs> so I look at this and I think, the man's a genius, right? It's like seeing a thousand dollar note on the, on the pavement and I yeah. should just go pick it up. Well, why, why has nobody else picked this up? Because yeah. in fact, there aren't any nested data parallel implementations available today, mm. despite the fact the guy did this work in the 90s. So we go to pick it up. This is with Manuel Chakravarti and Gabriel Keller and Roman Lachinsky and a, a little group of people at the University of New South Wales. And then we discover why nobody else has picked it up. It's blooming hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. So we've been working on this project for, I don't know, three or four years. Mm. Um, and, uh, uh, and we come across problems that we really didn't anticipate to do with them, <clears throat> and making sure that the asymptotics work out correctly. Um, and uh, we're just getting to the stage where all the pieces seem to be coming back together again. After, you know, we've had the thing in pieces several times, mm. and now it's just coming back together. But, so, so I regard this as being the kind of the long-term, my, my long-term hope for uh, 
uh, large-scale data parallelism. Why? Because, because it gives us a handle on locality and on granularity. Mm. These are the big difficulties for programming a parallel machine. Because if you, if, you, uh, if you divide your problem into grains that are too small, then the overheads overwhelm you. If you divide them into grains that are too big, you can't exploit enough processes. Mm. And if you move it from one machine to another, the answer might change, right? Sure. Um, the locality thing says if, you, um, oh, if one machine's working on some data and another machine's working on some data and then they need to, but this guy needs to talk to this guy's data, that's bad. So mm. somehow you have to think or somehow program in a way that related data ends up close together. And with ordinary functional, the sort of functional parallel functional programming we had up till, um, up till a few years ago, we really had no good story about that. You know, we just had heap allocated things with trees and pointers, you know, a big plate of spaghetti of uh, pointers going everywhere, and no handle on sort of physical locality in the memory hierarchy at all. Well, this data parallel stuff gives us a chance to do that because these big flat arrays, right? Remember, we transformed this funny nested structure into a sort of giant flat blobs of data yeah. that we can then carve up across the machines. Lots of good locality there. Excellent. So w this is not a solved problem. I regard this as being a pretty long-term research project. And we, you know, I'm not, I, I can't even promise success still. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think somehow we have to get a handle on granularity and locality, and this is the, a, a good way um, Excellent. to do it. So now, now speaking about concurrency a little bit, I mean, we, at this conference we've had, we've seen talks on Erlang and, and things like that where yeah. you sort of remove the problem because you, 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 you have these, or they're not actors obviously, right? Yeah. But you have these sort of blobs of, of computation that are just isolated. Right, right. Know, message passed Share between. Share nothing processes which, exactly. yeah, which through, communicate through messages. Now that still is, is quite effective in this world. Totally, But totally. it's a different so, problem, right? So, so I, th I see, uh, th I think it was, um, um, oh, I forget who it was who, who has this picture of concurrency as like an elephant. Right, that you know, there's different pygmies on different parts of it. Ah. I think concurrency and parallelism is too complicated a problem to solve with one programming paradigm, if you like. So I could might imagine that in a real program, you might have bits of data parallelism and bits of message passing concurrency and bits of STM. Mm. Right. So rather than saying, well, if you want message passing stuff, use Erlang. If you want data parallelism, use Fortran or maybe data parallel Haskell. If you want STM, use. You see what I mean? If yeah. you have to make this language up, this choice up front. Um, a, it prevents you having a single application that uses multiple forms of concurrency. Mm. Um, and, and B, well, writing in many, many languages is awkward. So my, my sort of uh, plan for world domination, if you like, <laughs> is to somehow make all, uh, to make lots of different concurrency paradigms, parallelism paradigms, available within a single language framework, namely in my case, Haskell. Now, uh, to come back to your question about um, Erlang then, so... Uh, what you should do when you see somebody doing something well is to just copy them, right? Imitation is the <laughs> sincerest form of flattery. So of late, uh, I've been working exactly on uh, trying to uh, take Erlang and build it in Haskell as a library. So what that means is that you'll be able to write, we're calling this Cloud Haskell. Interesting. It means you'll be able to write a distributed Haskell um, program running across, you know, thousands of cores, mm -hmm. thousands of machines with different, with, with not with shared memory, mm -hmm. in which the programmer it thinks, you know, their programming model is, I'm writing something very like an Erlang process that shares nothing, no pointers are crossing uh, with, with other Erlang-like processes, and which you explicitly send a message in a somewhat imperative way, and when you do the send, you know that that message will be serialized, then you're not swinging a pointer, you're serializing the data and you're squirting it over a, a message link to somebody else, right? Nice. Um, so in effect, we'll give you the, provide the Erlang model, complete with its, um, the very important part is about Erlang is this business about being able to watch whether other processes have died, so that if they die, you can restart them or do something. So there's this way of linking processes, Erlang's failure model, if you like. I think that's one of the great things that Erlang has given to the world, and we're just going to you know, steal it wholesale. And, uh, right on. And, uh, um, so Cloud Haskell, is, at the moment, it's a prototype. It was a master's um, project done by a guy called Jeff Epstein. Um, nice. But it's attracted quite a lot of uh, attention. I think we're going to try to re-engineer it and make it um, solid enough to use for real applications. Perfect. Um, Talk to me about what you're doing to help push the teaching of computer science forward. Right. Well, so th this has become, <laughs> this was a, a kind of little part of my life a few, years, a few years ago. Now it's become quite a big part of my life, partly through my children. Ah. Was what, what happened was that I discovered my kids were going to school and they were learning a subject called ICT, hmm. Information and Communication Technology. This is the name of the subject at British schools. Um, and it was dull. 
right? Because it was essentially, let's learn how to use Microsoft Office. <laughs> and then next year, let's learn how to use Microsoft Office again. Interesting. And it was often taught by non-specialist teachers. So as I talked to other people about this, I found that many people have had the same experience and that really nobody was happy about the state of ICT education in British schools. And it turned out that what happened was that, uh, oh, 20 years ago, the um, late 80s, early 90s, there was uh, something called the BBC Micro. Have you heard of the BBC Micro? I have not. Oh, this was a big thing in Britain. The BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, ran a, um, uh, ran a project in which they uh, got a company to build a microprocessor that was going to be available in lots of schools. And they ran lots of educational programs around it. Um, and it was huge, you know, every school had their BBC Micros, every, you know, and, and what could you do with the BBC Micro? You could program it in BASIC, that was really all you could do. Mm. Um, so what that meant was that, that there was lots of programming going on at schools, right? there was nothing else you could do with it, it didn't actually have, I mean, it had a few games, um, but it was all pretty basic, it was back in the days of hobbyist microprocessors, really. Right? Mm. Then over the following 20 years, somehow there was a gradual shift away from something that was recognisably computer science-like at school, and kind of for the best of reasons, but with the worst of results, towards applications, and in particular office applications. So now kids get Microsoft Offices, and I say, as I say, and it's kind of like learning how to how to drive a car instead of learning how to design it. Mm. Um, and it's done with good intentions and uh, then sort of upwards thinking. It's more than just learning how to underline in Word. It's, it's kind of like, let's do a business plan for a small business and develop advertising brochures that will use your uh, PowerPoint skills or, uh, or a presentation about how good a business it is. So there's a sort of context for it. Sure. But I have trouble really believing that this is, well, it certainly wasn't motivating for my kids. And, and furthermore, it leaves a complete void, right? Because there's no computer science left at all, right? So uh, what I discovered was lots of people felt bad about this. So we started with, with help from my lab director, Andrew Herbert, we started something called the Computing at School Working Group in okay. Britain. It's a kind of equivalent to the Computer Science Teachers Association in the United States. Okay. Um, so it's really a grassroots organization. Um, it's supported by Microsoft, but it is not a Microsoft creature. Mm. Right? It's also supported by Google as well. I'm rather proud mm. to be uh, the chair of something that is uh, supported by both Microsoft and Google. It's good to be <laughs> on the same side for a change. Yes, that's um, good. And, uh, and our goal is to fix the state of ICT education in British schools, particularly by establishing computing or computer science as a proper subject. At the moment, if you ask a head teacher in a British school whether they would recognize uh, computing or ICT as a subject in the way that they would recognize physics or maths, mm. they would say no. It's, it's a kind of, they would say, oh, we have you know, good ICT provision. We have ICT suites with lots of computers in them. We have you know, an ICT teacher. We use interactive whiteboards to teach geography, right? Mm. But it's not a subject like maths that you would, you know, you wouldn't dream of getting a, spare, a geography teacher with a spare lesson to teach a maths, to teach a maths lesson, maybe to cover something that was provided by a maths teacher. Do, do you see what I mean? Yes. So it's a question, of, and as a result, ICT teachers at the moment have very low status in British schools. Actually, they're really good people. I've talked to a lot of them now. They're quite motivated. They're, they're fed up with the situation they're in, and they're actually keen to improve, to improve their subject, but they're kind of held back by the, the context. Right? Mm. So our goal is to sort of up, up status them, to make them um, feel, uh, to, just, just to make uh, ICT and computing into a sort of valuable high-status subject like maths or computing, help provide lots of training for ICT teachers, and to get um, uh, the government... Right, the Department for Education, yeah. to somehow recognize computer science as a valuable thing at school. And we've been making a lot of progress with that. Excellent. Now, how do you, now of course, you're not you know, going to be teaching Haskell in this context, uh, right? It's a little too complex. Yeah, yeah. How do you balance you know, sort of the, the, you know, the use of, of software and, and you know, really highly abstracted computation, that you, you know, like using Office or building a spreadsheet mm -hmm. or whatever, um, and not getting too caught up in the details of you know, lambdas and monads and things like this? How do you balance that? That's cool. So, so I, I, th these two, you know, my Haskell life and my school life are uh, <laughs> very separate at the moment. I just want to get something that is recognizably the subject that with the discipline of computer science, okay. if you like, uh, uh, available at school. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, one thing you've got to do is to write down what is this thing called computer science or computing that you might want to teach at school. So we've written a kind of a curriculum for um, computing at school. Just type uh, computing at school into um, Bing and you'll find our, <laughs> our um, little outward facing site together with this curriculum document. But how is it, where's the rubber going to hit the road? In the end, it's going to be some form of programming. Okay. That's the place to start. 
clearly, right? So computer science is about more than programming, right? But you couldn't really call somebody a computer scientist if they didn't, if they'd never written a program, mm. right? So sure. it's a kind of necessary but not sufficient condition. So I kind of don't want to get too hooked up on programming because in a way it's the means to an end, but it's very powerful means to the end, mean, means to the end, right? So, because it's so motivating to write programs that do things that this computer has never done before. Sure. It's so creative and, it's, and it teaches all the skills of abstraction that you're referring to. When you start to write little programs and you get tired of drawing a square, uh, by writing the same code again and again with cut and paste, then you realize, oh, I could give it a name and call it a procedure, and then I could call it from many places, and now, oh, that draws a square in the same place. Maybe if I gave it a parameter, I could make it draw a square in different places. Suddenly, there's a very immediate sort of visceral feedback kind of sense. And what, what have you learned? You've learned something very powerful called abstraction, yep. right? Um, but we haven't had a lesson about abstraction. We've had a lesson about, let's you know, draw houses using logo or something. Oh. And another thing that's changed in the last um, uh, decade, certainly, is that there are very nice programming environments available for kids now. So 20 years ago, it was BBC Basic, or sort of some variant of a textual language like Basic. Then there was a sort of a great slough of despond in which there really wasn't anything very much. Mm. Um, there were a kind of handful of things like, like Logo were being a, a, a notable exception. But now there's a whole bunch of really nice tools like Scratch, which is extremely popular and has a, has a whole sort of social network kind of aspect as well. Alice, Kodu is a Microsoft research um, uh, 3D graphics game in which you write little, little programs that control the things that move around on the screen and the programs that you write have this kind of visual character. You snap together little um, uh, jigsaw-like pieces so nice. you don't get syntax errors. Scratch is <laughs> like that too. Um, Greenfoot is a, uh, is, a, is a programming environment actually for Java, but it's, it's designed for teaching. So it starts off right away with a screen with little avatars that move around. So increasingly, people have, the, the, you know, heavy, high-powered computer scientists and people interested in education have been developing these programming environments for kids, and they're enormously effective. You can do this from primary school onwards easily. Sure. Um, and that's really exciting because that really wasn't available a few years ago. Mm. Um, so I think this whole business about getting something you know, seriously about the, what is computation, the idea that you can um, uh, write programs that control things and then maybe look at the natural world right, through these same spectacles and think of, I don't know, an ant colony. How does that have this sort of collective behavior? Mm. Right? And you can think, oh, maybe if you write a kind of, uh, in Greenfoot, if you write little, um, little programs for ants, you can give them sort of flocking behavior and think, oh, Maybe this is telling us something about the more uh, allowing us to model the natural world too, and that's quite exciting. So that's what I mean about being computing, about being more than about just programming. What's your take on? Uh, I don't know if you had time to kind of think about Dart or read their paper, but beyond that, the notion of of, of an optional type system. So it's curious that you should ask that because uh, we've been thinking about that for Haskell just in the last month or two. Interesting. Uh, so so here's how it goes for. Um, <clears throat> At the moment, if you, if you uh, have a Haskell program and it has a type error, we just reject the program. We won't run it at all. Mm. But it turns out, internally, if you, if you write your program and we accept it, you know, the type system accepts it, internally, because GHC's type system has become more sophisticated, involving type-level functions, mm. right? so there's some type-level computation going on, remember I said there's this very simple intermediate language? Now, this type-level computation stuff happens in the type checker, and we didn't want to make the intermediate language have to do this type-level computation, which is quite complicated. To do that in this checking thing, it's supposed to be simple. Mm. So what we did was we arranged to make the, the, effectively the theorems that the type checker proves turn into little data structures or uh, fragments of syntax tree, if you like, that encode the way that the type checker proved that these two, two types were equal. Mm. Right? So there's a little thing that you might call a proof object. It's actually a value. Um, and that becomes part of the program. So the program becomes bigger. It's, and it, so the, the program uh, get, then gets fed through the compiler together with these proof objects. Right? At the end, they're thrown away just before code generation. So they don't have any effect on the runtime behavior, but they, they're, they're consistently maintained. Now, um, what that means is that if you have a point which the type checker says, oh, int equals bool, you say, ah, oh, it's not true, reject program. Instead of reject program, we'll just generate one of these proof objects which says, if you ever evaluate me, fail. Right? 
Now this little proof object goes down the, 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 down the um, type checker chain and actually does end up in the final runtime. And what that means is that if you ever call a function that, need, that needs a value of type bool, but gets a value of type int, at that moment, that value will be wrapped by, as part of this translation process. The, the value will be wrapped in a kind of impedance matcher that says effectively, convert from int to bool. And the convert from int to bool will fail. Right? So what that means is that if you don't explore that part of the program, if you run some part of the program that doesn't involve any of these type checks that fails, everything is fine. So well, it, well, the, the, the net effect is you compile your program. Instead of a bunch of type errors, you get a bunch of type warnings. And then when you run your program, if you're running the bits that don't involve those type warnings, everything will be fine. Hmm. But if at runtime you encounter something where you needed an int and you've got a bool, you'll get a, you know, a civilized failure. And of course, that's just what you want. More of, a, more of the civilized failure will give you exactly the error message mm. that you would have got in the first place. Excellent. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a bit like what he was describing. Mm. Uh, it's very close, actually. I think the main difference is that if you, uh, with the system we have in mind, uh, if you convert from, if you have an int and you need it to be a string, and then that string goes somewhere else, and then you need it to be an int again, in Dart, they'll sort of short circuit that whole thing. Say, I need an int, I've got an int, that's fine. But we'll go through two impedance matches, right? Mm. Both of which will say, no, 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 no. Mm. <laughs> so that we're, so we, we, we probably won't run programs that, um, that do that, but we'll, we'll if you get to dead code. So this business about um, being able to run programs that are not quite type correct, I think we'll be able to accommodate remarkably easily, partly because, <laughs> curiously, our type system has become more sophisticated. Mm. You know, it gives us the wiggle room to do that. Do you worry about what happens a lot in languages um, that they start getting too big and the type systems get too complex? So that's, uh, I mean, uh, the, the sort of heat, the, the, this is, this is uh, death by, by sort of heat exhaustion. <laughs> it's, you know, when, <laughs> it's the, uh, um, what I think of as happening here. And I think there is a danger of that, clearly. So Haskell is, you know, I just keep lobbing new features into Haskell that does make the language more complicated. Mm. You know, uh, there are zillions of language extension flags now. So I suppose I think of it like this, is that Haskell is a kind of laboratory in which we're lobbing things in and that maybe eventually the whole thing will die under its own weight, right? Mm. And that maybe some better phoenix will emerge, you know, some, some successor of, <laughs> of me will come out with something better. But meanwhile, it seems um, I don't think I'm clever enough to uh, pull out exactly the, you know, the, the, the sub-feature set, the beautiful small language that will, that will do the job. When, when we first designed Haskell, um, we wrote to Tony Hoare, or let's say Phil Wobbler wrote to Tony Hall mm. um, to explain about what we were doing. And, um, uh, and Tony wrote back saying uh, that the, the words that I remember was, I fear that Haskell is doomed to succeed. <laughs> and what he meant was, this is a much more complicated language than I would like to see. And Tony is a genius at de devising very, very small sort of pearl-like languages that address a particular um, uh, sort of isolate in the highest possible relief a particular kind of computation or something. So mm. Haskell, because it's a, oh, the general purpose language, we, we deliberately moved away from that into, into having a rather, you know, there's more than one way to do lots of things. But the one thing that I think is, is sort of keeps us sane and means there's some chance that Haskell won't fall apart in this way too soon is that we have this kind of core principles established in the most concretely in the form of this intermediate language that mean that however crazy we are here, we turn it into something small and principled. Mm -hmm. And that kind of limits the craziness, if you like. Or another way to say it is that much of the source language stuff can be explained by translation into something simpler. Mm -hmm. And that's a way that programmers can grok. So uh, um, that's, that's the one, that's something I cling to, if you like, to say, in the midst of all this complexity, there's an underlying principle, simplicity, at, le at least I hope there is, and that maybe, you know, in the fullness of time, somebody cleverer than me will look at this, you know, large, rather complicated in places ad hoc source language and say, I can see how to boil out something yet more beautiful from that. Excellent. Well, hey, thank you for coming on Channel 9. And it's always, you know, it's, it's funny that we had to come all the way yeah, across all the way to the Melbourne, Melbourne. <laughs> all the way to Melbourne to finally yeah. get you on C9. Yeah. Um, but I will ask one more question because I can never an end when I, apparently I'm going to, and that <laughs> is, um, what's your take on, on sort of where the more general purpose, object-oriented, industrial strength, widely used languages uh -huh. are becoming a little bit more hybrid? A 
lot of a lot of functional stuff mm -hmm. is getting into certainly C sharp and Java. Mm -hmm. um, what do you what do you think of that? Well, so I think that's very exciting, right? <laughs> and it's and it's due due in um, in no small measure to um, mm -hmm. to people like Eric Meyer, who sure. you've had on Channel Nine a lot. Oh yeah, right? he's a hero. Here. Eric's, he's a sort of fantastic bridge person because he lives in Microsoft product land, mm. um, but he totally understands all this sort of functional stuff more you know more than I do half the time. He's a, you know he knows category theory uh -huh. big time. Um, so he's a sort of secret pipeline of, of this stuff. And so it, I think it's very encouraging that C Sharp has become recognizably more of a functional language over time. Where are things going in the end? I, I don't know. I think in the end, I feel as if the whole idea of programming with values in a declarative way has a kind of long-term value that is, if you like, the advantages are becoming more apparent over time mm. and the disadvantages are becoming less so. So I think this is a trend that is likely to continue in some form. Quite whether it will surface in the end as a language like Haskell, which is by default pure, I, I think in the end we'll be programming languages that, that are by default pure with access to impurity, rather than languages that are by default impure with, uh, you know, with functional features. Hmm. Whether that, ooh, that sort of, that, that will be a hard transition to make, but there's such a big investment of you know, very clever people and interesting software in mm. the sort of imperative plan. But, but I think there is, there's, so this, there's, we're back to the Nirvana, Nirvana picture, yes. if you like. Um, so I think we're kind of moving towards, to, towards Nirvana a bit. Yeah. But um, I, I still feel that somehow the, the by default purity is the one thing that functional programming has to offer the world, um, a sort of remorseless, relentless concentration mm. um, Purity is the right default, and I just don't, I don't know how that will end up surfacing, whether it will be very visible or somehow behind the scenes, but it's important. Absolutely. So, and I feel very privileged to have been you know, given the chance by Microsoft and earlier Her Majesty's Government to work on that mm. for, well, you know, kind of like 30 years now. It's an embarrassingly <laughs> long time. Excellent. Well, hey, keep on going, keep yeah. pushing the envelope, and I look forward to chatting with you again sometime someplace in the world. Yeah, that would be great. Right on. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Great to see you. Great. Cheers. Thank <music> you.